with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni moli wanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jadley and this is the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We're coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted that you're joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Jen Bailey. She is here to celebrate her beautiful book. It's called A Friend for Henry. Before we invite Jen into the studio, we would love to invite you to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. That's where you can go to sign up for our free newsletter. Find out what's coming up on the show. Find out what you might have missed. Download a whole lot of free goodies. It's also a great place to contact us. We have a great contact button. They can send us a note. We respond immediately. You can also get in touch with us through social media, facebook.com slash reading with your kids, at reading with your kids on Instagram and at Jedly Magic on Twitter. You can ask us questions about the show. You can suggest authors to include in future episodes of the show. You can also ask us how we can create a free virtual literacy fair for your school. Check it out today, readingwithyourkids.com. Join us right now from Leeward and the great state of Kansas. Our, our guest today is the author of a really powerful book. It's called A Friend for Henry. Please welcome to the show, Jen Bailey. Hey, Jen, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing great. You know, one of the neat things about about doing this podcast is I get to make a lot of new friends, and I also get to, to, to re-meet these friends that I didn't know I had. And they're people who, you know, we just meet on Zoom for a minute and then we find out that we have all these things in common and we have just such a great time. And, and Jen and I just did that. And so I'm excited to have her here, uh, formerly from the great state of Rhode Island, um, now, in, now in Kansas, and now the author of the award-winning book, A Friend for, for Henry. Can you tell us a little bit about Henry in the book? Sure. So A Friend for Henry is about a little boy who is trying to figure out how to how to find a friend and how to have a friend. Um, it, it is told uh, that Henry himself, you could say, is on um, the autism spectrum or is neurodiverse. Uh, but it's not I didn't really want to mention that in the story, because, first of all, I don't think that's how Henry would introduce himself mm-hmm. to you. I think Henry would just say he's a he's a boy who's looking for a friend. Um, and second, I think that there's a lot of children and readers who might see themselves there, but might not be on the spectrum. And I think that that's perfectly fine. Some of us are more shy. Some of us have more trouble making friends. And I, and so I wanted to, to let kids see, to let more kids see themselves in Henry. Mm-hmm. You know, you're talking about being shy. We had um, Jane Yolen, a, a phenomenal mm-hmm. author of, of over 400 books. She was on the show and she said something that, I absolutely can relate to. She said it is way, way easier for her to be in front of an audience of 3,000 people and engage them and just hold their attention for an hour, but put her in a room with three or four people at, you know, like a little dinner party, and she just goes quiet and silent and wants to go into a corner and, and hide. I can absolutely relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, you- what a what a wonderful person! How great that you got to have her on the show. Oh, yeah, she she was she was phenomenal. But I, I, that's something I definitely can relate to too. It's you know, um, you know, I think when we when we we label people like with a with a label of on this on the spectrum or neurodiverse or even just shy, we're not seeing the whole person. We're we're just seeing that that tag. And uh, we're doing we're doing the person a disservice, but also doing ourselves a great disservice as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And this was a reason why, as I said, it was intentionally not put in the story. This is not um, children don't tag themselves. Mm. Uh, <laughs> we do that. We put them in a box, and unfortunately, once we put them in a box, we put them on a shelf, 
And that's where they stay. And we don't get to meet that whole wonderful individual person. And so that was really a main point of of um, having this story told. You know, uh, a lot of times when we go into classrooms, the first student, and I know you go into classrooms too, the first the students that you that you meet are the ones who are a bit more extrovert. There's a bit more energy there, and they they will actively look to have your attention. And so they end up getting a lot of that, mm-hmm. a lot of our attention, and a lot of our notice. And it's the it's the other kids. Um, who might have just as much to say to us and who might want to, to meet us just as badly. And yet we won't get that opportunity if we don't make that opportunity. And so that was a reason for this book too, was to show that, you know, sometimes you need to spend a little bit more time Mm -hmm. to, uh, to get to know somebody. And it's always worth that investment. Absolutely. And I love that you use that word investment. You know, when we invest in investing our time to get to know another person, even even if the return on that investment is finding out, well, I don't really like that person a whole lot. I'm not going to trust her. It's, exactly. it's, it's really worth it because, you know, getting to know people, people are, are so amazing and so awesome. They're, and they're also very different. Mm-hmm. And, and I love that you said that, that maybe, maybe, maybe what you're going to find out is, oh, okay, this person's better. Me and them are better at a distance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because I, I actually was asked that by a librarian who saw that in the book. She said what she loved about it was that Henry kind of finds out you don't need to be a friend with everybody. Mm-hmm. You, you just need to be kind. You're going to have some people that you're friends with and some people that that you won't necessarily be as close to, but there's there's always opportunity to be kind to one another. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really important when we tell our kids all the time, oh, you've got to be a friend, you've got to be a friend. Nah, sometimes maybe not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes maybe it's not going to work, and that's okay. Um, but you still can be kind to each other. Absolutely, yeah. I... Um... As you're talking about the book and as I was preparing for the interview, I was thinking back, back in 1988, 89, I was working in a school that was run by the Boston University School of Medicine, um, and it was a school for kids with severe developmental disabilities, and the school was on the hospital campus, and we were on the third floor, so we were isolated. We, you know, the only other people that that our kids saw and the, our kids were had severe uh, challenges they were all in wheelchairs none of them could speak some of them could communicate with with various uh, devices and means but um they were isolated and the only folks that they saw was the teachers the doctors in the other departments you know uh, no kids and they hired me because i was goofy and i wanted to be a professional clown and i was okay getting out and being silly in front of an audience and calling attention to myself. They wanted me to create a program that took these kids into classrooms and gave them opportunities to make friends. And oh. it was a it was a huge success. But as you were talking about Henry, I realized my kids had an advantage because they had this loud, goofy guy who wore Hawaiian shirts and loved calling attention to himself, and I was their voice and advocate. A kid like Henry doesn't really have anybody like that usually. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, where where we're living now, our school system um, actually set up a program uh, not for – because it, it, Henry is very much like my, my middle child. Um, and uh, – but they set up a program for siblings – Mm. Um, of children who who might be neurodiverse or might have other um, uh, other things going on uh, and including disabilities, and they were to help the the siblings um, not only have a, a a group that they could belong to who might understand them, but to help the siblings learn how to help advocate mm-hmm. um, that they didn't want these kids to to. Uh, the, oh, well, that's, you know, that's the weird kid's brother or mm-hmm. something like that. It was, it, it was a wonderful program that they did. And it, I found it, it was very helpful that, that the whole family kind of needs to be involved in situations like this. And it's great when we can have advocates and then we can help these children learn how to self-advocate. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, as you were speaking and it just 
goes to show you what an, a, kind of a Neanderthal child, childhood I had. You know, we had kids who were neurodiverse and had challenges growing up, and it seemed that the only choice that their siblings had was when, when someone would say something, it would either be, yeah, and turn you back on the sibling or – beat the person up that was saying, talking, <laughs> talking stuff. That was my childhood too. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that we're getting to the point where we're, you know, we're helping siblings kind of understand and giving them tools that they need other than their fists. And also I, I think a book like a friend for Henry is really valuable for the kids who aren't on the spectrum to, to, you know, start conversations at the family dinner table, on the couch, sitting down and talking to our kids and encouraging them to be advocates for kids like Henry, to care for them and to be the kid in the classroom who stands up and, and offers to be friends with with these kids who are quote unquote different. Yeah, I, I thank you so much. I, I mean, um, that's that's really near and dear to my heart. And actually, it was a second grade teacher in Boston who reached out to tell me um, that they had read the book in class. And after they had finished it, they, they did have a neurodiverse student. And after it was done, one of the kids in the class turned and said, Henry's just like you, <laughs> and pointed at that child. And and it, it she said it just changed the dynamic in the classroom. Um, that there, that, that the other kids had a better understanding of maybe why, uh, their classmate would suddenly shout something that to them seemed totally unrelated to the topic at hand. And, and if, as you see in the book, I mean, Henry kind of does that. But what I tried to show was all the thought processes that were going on in his head before he makes that vocalization, before he says something to who he hopes is going to be a friend, he's really thought it out. We, we as the, as the person on the outside don't see that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But usually there's a whole lot going on yeah. uh, before, before we interact with each other. And um, it's, it's nice to get a glimpse in. Um, this book has been considered a what is it, a mirror and windows mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. So for a child who might be neurodiverse or who might be more introverted, uh, it's a mirror for them. So they can see themselves having success. And then it's a window for the child who's not that way. So they can hopefully see a bit into what it's like to be that kind of a person. Yeah. And I hope it generates empathy. I hope so, too. You know. Talking about getting a look inside the, the, the mind and the thought process of a child that was neurodiverse, that is something. When I worked with those those kids at that school, we had, at that time, the autism spectrum was fairly narrow and it was fairly severe. I mean, the, the kids that we worked with who had that label of autistic, um, they weren't communicating with any, and very few would be able to make eye contact and there's the, the rocking and the hand motions and, and whatnot. And I, I, there's this one little girl named Rashi that I remember and we we're very close. Um, but she, and she always wanted to hold my hand. She always wanted to hug me, but she couldn't look me in the eye. Mm -hmm. And I wanted so much to be able to just take a peek inside. Cause I knew that there was something going on an intelligence that was going on, an awareness that was going on that we didn't understand. And I wanted desperately to be able to understand it. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I get what you're saying for sure. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about Henry's thought process? Um, so, uh, like, I guess in the, be in the beginning of the story, um, the first person that he meets is Vivianne. And so I, I, I do a bit of, well, what would... Um, what would, what would, he, so he's got some rules <laughs> for his be for his friends. They would share, they would be kind. Um, and when he meets Vivienne, his first thoughts about her, and, and I'll just read from the sure. book if that's okay. Yeah. Um, he said, Vivienne was a kaleidoscope, a tangle of colors. She had ribbons and clackety shoes. She knew every pony song. Her fingernails were painted like rainbows. And so this is how he sees her. He sees her very visually. He sees her auditorially. You know, he hears, he kind of has, has, um, sense all this sensory going on. And if you think about it, it's very jumbled and it's very chaotic. And that can be unnerving and, and concerning for, uh, for somebody who likes things a little more in order. Um, 
And so with all of that being said, Henry's first thought to her is, when I get paint on my fingers, I wash it off. <laughs> because that's the rule. There's no painting on people. Yeah. And um, and here she's walking around with this with this paint. So he's trying to find a way to connect. And uh, and unfortunately, it, it doesn't really work mm-hmm. very well. Um, but what I wanted to show was, you know, he's trying. He's, he's looking for the way in. But you kind of get that feeling right away that this kind of jumble and, and noise and color chaos is just not going to quite, not going to quite work for him. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm really glad that, that, and that's a beautiful, um, portrait. And I think it's very eye opening. And I, what I hope is that in addition to opening up kids' eyes, this is definitely a book that absolutely should be read by a family together because I think, is going to open up some parental eyes because I, I know a lot of parents and I was probably guilty of this, you know, might look at, you know, the kid and, and they're caring and it's like, Oh yeah, there's a kid that's different in the class and we have to make some accommodations, but man, Oh man, I just wish, and, you know, why can't you, it, it's been, it's been a while. It's been four months. It's been six months. Why can't you kind of get it together? And, I I know at this point, what's been forever in my life, those, when the vacuum cleaner goes on in my house, I can't be in the same room. It, just that high whining, just drives, I, I it, it really just drives me up a wall and I can't handle it. And so I need to put myself and imagine what it would be like to have those feelings magnified by 10 or 20 or 100 when I, when I heard any kind of a loud noise, when I had all these colors flashing at me and, you know, some of these painted fingernails might not flash in my eyes, but it could really almost be like a strobe effect in someone who had these hyper senses. And, you know, hopefully, you know, parent reading this book with their child might stop and say, hmm, that's why this kid needs more than six months. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. And, and thank you so much. I, I, I love the idea of families sitting down uh, to read this and to share this and to talk about it, um, to have those those chats with each other of, you know, is there somebody in the classroom or is there somebody in the family? I mean, the, so often now that this diagnosis is, is being given more and more often um, and that it's an opportunity absolutely to to even just talk about well how do you make friends well what are what are the quote unquote rules you might have for uh what you would consider to be a good friend you know um and and those are really good things to explore especially as we get older mm-hmm. and we get we have so many more influences from from friendships or from culture or society is to kind of know Boundaries are okay. You know, we're, we're, we're so rushing to tell our children, oh, you know, say hello to the nice man, be a friend with this person, do all of these things. And we're, we're telling them kind of to, to not set any boundaries up for themselves when sometimes they might need a few. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that might make them feel more protected and more, more secure. Uh, as I said, but, but there's always an opportunity to, to, um, to be to show kindness and mm-hmm. to to give somebody more time and um, yeah to kind of let them into your world a little bit too yeah yeah you were mentioning earlier that Henry is a lot like your second your middle child my middle child yes can you how is your um was your middle child the inspiration for Henry absolutely absolutely so I have three um, three children and um, so. Uh, Harris was, was diagnosed with Asperger's, which was, uh, is on that autism spectrum, uh, in third grade. Until that time, we had felt, well, there's something interesting <laughs> going on. Uh, but, but he, very bright and, and, um, getting on well in school and everything else. And then in what happened in third grade was we moved. We mm. moved from, we were living in Virginia at the time and we moved here to Kansas. And that was a really big disruption in the everyday and the rules and the normal. And, um, and that's when more and more things came out. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, we were starting to, um, 
notice uh, some issues at school and he was being very quiet. And, and I just am grateful for the, the school having spent time with us. And then, and then the, um, uh, the professionals here in, in Kansas city and in uh, Johnson County specifically for helping us, because I, I fear that if we didn't have an understanding of what was going on with Harris, um, it would not it would not have worked out well, mm-hmm. meaning that there would have become behavioral issues, and as you were saying, probably fists would have started being mm-hmm. used instead of voices. Um, and we all need to help help each other and to to learn how to communicate um, in ways that are that are positive. And that was something that was able to be done in in our environment. Uh, it wasn't always easy, <laughs> but it was good. Yeah. Well. Family isn't easy. Family's family's beautiful. Family is 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 wonderful, but it's not easy. Yeah, and and especially when you've got somebody who, you know, the family is used to doing this and going this way and being in this direction, and and there's somebody in the family who maybe, uh, you know, maybe needs to to not have the big birthday, or maybe needs to not, maybe, you know, let's not have people over today, um, mm-hmm. or let's, or if we're going to, then don't force me to be part. Let mm-hmm. me, let me have a quiet space where I can recharge myself. And when I'm ready, I can enter into this, this family unit or family event. And then I can also withdraw. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, I think, that's, you know, my journey as a, as a parent with my beautiful wife, we learned a lot of things along the way. So if anybody's listening out there and you, you're, you're hearing this and you go, oh man, I, I made, I made a mistake. I should have done this differently. Don't worry about it. Jen, Jen probably made some mistakes, probably not as many as I made. And it, it took a long time for my, me and my beautiful wife to realize like with my son, um, very different than my, my daughter. And at one point, we we just kind of understood, dude. If you need to be by yourself, here's a space. Yeah. You just go down. You just let us know that you need to go down and, and be by yourself, and and that's good. It's not a timeout. Where it's it's your space, and you can go down there. And wouldn't it be better to go down there and chill and kind of get yourself together than to get in this fight that we always seem to be getting into? And it was wonderful. Like it was almost like magic. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. And and how fantastic that you could see that and you could sense that and you you knew how to help and um, come alongside. I think that that's just fantastic. Good on you. Well, <laughs> I, I I can't take credit for knowing how to help. It might have been that we tried everything else, and this seems to be like the last. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, for an example, um, you know, so we, we had, we would have take turns. It's your turn to set the table and to clear the table and to do the things, right? Each, each child had their evening that they, they helped out as a family member. And, um, so the, the, the rule was, okay, you need to feed the dog, set the table and, and fill the water glasses. And when we would tell Harris to do that, he would stall. He would, he would panic. He would, he would actually freeze. And, it it was th- trying to figure out well what's the problem and instead of saying well get going get going and snapping the fingers it was it, we kind of had to start to realize that um, there's something else going on and his problem was that we those instructions all came together mm-hmm. and he couldn't figure out how to do them all at once so it became a simple matter of please feed the dogs then set the table then. Fill the water glasses. Yeah. Now he's got a sequence. Mm-hmm. Now he knows how to get it done. And it, so sometimes it's as simple as that. It's yeah. as simple as taking a step back and and reworking the problem. Yeah. And that is so – if 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 you don't get – take anything else away from this interview, take that away. When, when you're dealing with your kids and you're frustrated and you feel like you're banging your head against the wall, don't, don't. Just step back and regroup and, and reevaluate. Yeah, oh, I put myself in timeout a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we can all use it. There we go. <laughs> hey, I, I have to find out what was what was Harris's reaction when he read this book. Oh, I mean, he he actually really loves this book. And 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 um 
I always chat with him before I do something like mm-hmm. this. He he'll be turning twenty five on Saturday. Awesome. Happy birthday! <laughs> so I always chat and I ask, you know, is is it okay? I'm going to be talking about this and we're going to be doing that. And yeah, he's he's on board. He's he's a wonderful um, resource for me. I, I of course, since it's not my lived experience, I absolutely want to make sure that I'm being true and and faithful and honest. Um, What's lovely is Chronicle. We're, I'm doing some chapter books now with Henry as a oh. character. They'll be coming out in uh, in 2023 and 2024. And Harris has been a wonderful help with that, too, because I'll be writing and I'll say, you know, this is how I remember it. And then he can give me how he remembers it. Um, and and then, of course, it's not it's been, of course, it's a fictional story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, um, uh, yeah, he's he's pleased that 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 uh, it's been a helpful thing for families and for, for schools. That's wonderful. Uh, Jen, tell everybody where they can go to find out more about you and find out more about A Friend for Henry, please. Oh, that's sweet. Um, So I do have a website. It's currently being reconstructed, but you can probably find me there. <laughs> and that's at www.jen, that's two N's, J-E-N-N, Bailey, B-A-I-L-E-Y dot com. And I'm on Twitter, the same, Jen Bailey. Um, and I kind of look around on Instagram. But uh, so you can absolutely find me probably best on, on the website and Twitter. Um, and then just go ahead and look. I know my locals sell this, but sell the book. Um, I love to come out and, and visit and talk with uh, with schools and organizations. So if you're thinking about that, I'd be happy to hear from you. Awesome. We've had a wonderful time talking to the author of A Friend for Henry, Jen Bailey. Hey, Jen, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. This was really splendid, and I'm just so grateful that, uh, that I got to, come and, to, got to come and play with you for a little while <laughs> and get to know you. <laughs> Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest would be G. Brian Benson. Brian's going to be joining us to tell us all about his epic cross-country adventure. Don't want to miss it. It's a real, real fun conversation. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to start by thanking our guest, Jen Bailey. Be sure to check out a friend for Henry. I also want to thank my team, Alejandro Doherty, Fatima Khan. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.